Hey, what's up guys? I'm Kay Ingram and I'm a contributor host with Rolling Stone Magazine. But this evening I will be your moderator for a webinar that I'm so excited about. It's called Data Driven Journalism, Using Data to Drive Stories That Matter. Now, before we get started, I just wanna do some quick thank yous that have to go out to people who helped make this webinar happen. Of course, NABJ, NABJ Students, NABJ Broadcast Task Force, VP of Broadcast, Dorothy Tucker, Jovan Riley, and Drew Barry, Angela Robinson, and Kanya Stewart. And of course, last but not least, our amazing panelists who are gonna tell you a little bit more about themselves in a sec, but just some quick like housekeeping rules um, just to help keep this moving along. Um, just a heads up, we will have a hard stop time of 7.15. And that is because we have another amazing webinar that you're definitely gonna wanna check out after this. And as well, you're gonna wanna just take note of the Q&A tab at the bottom of this webinar screen. That's where you're going to be asking your questions for these lovely speakers. And I'll just be sifting back and forth throughout the duration of this, just to see what you guys are asking. I encourage you, encourage you to ask them, you know, as this is going on. And then as far as the order, we're gonna have ladies first. So Kimbrielle, you will start with our questions and then we'll go to Mitali and then we'll go with Nigel. And so I'm in New York, so you guys can hear the New York, <laughs> like, you know, stuff in the background, don't mind that. And then very, very last but least, uh, hashtags. Definitely, if you're on Twitter, social media, you're gonna wanna hashtag NABJ webinars with an S and NABJ data. All right, guys. Those were all my notes. <laughs> so let's get into this. Let's just have you all just introduce yourselves. Kimbrielle, if you wanna start first, name where you work and a little bit of what you do. Sure, uh, my name is Kimbrielle Kelly. Welcome everyone. I am an investigative reporter on the investigative unit at the Washington Post. Um, I've been there for about six years. I've worked on um, about four year long series in uh, that period of time, two of which either won a Pulitzer or was a finalist for the Pulitzer um, involving uh, subprime lending and minorities, um, police officer involved shootings, um, police being fired from departments and rehired, and all sorts of misconduct. Awesome, thank you. All right, Mitali, you're next. Hi, everybody. I'm Mitali Nkande. I work for a research institute called Data and Society, which is here also in New York City. I'm a former forecast journalist. I worked for the BBC. I worked for CNN. I worked for ABC. Then really came into, really through investigations, thinking about the impact that advanced technologies, technologies had on black and brown communities. This year, I have been looking specifically about how race happens online um, with an interest in white supremacy. And I am really interested in supporting black journalists and making sure that they're breaking some of these, the stories that I see their white counterparts being really involved in. Awesome, we'll take the support. All right, Nigel, you're up next. Hi folks, my name is Nigel Chawaya. I am a graphics reporter and data reporter at NBC News, also in New York City. Um, before that, I have held similar roles at the Wall Street Journal and DNA Info, RIP forever. Um, but I've also been a neighborhood beat reporter um, and I was a C student in math. And I say that to make you see that anyone can do this. It's not magic. I love that. Well, you're very modest because I feel like for people such as myself, I'm like, a lot of what you all do seems like magic. It is beyond me, but that is why I'm so excited to, uh, to have this webinar, just to kind of explain for people who might be intimidated by data and you all can just kind of break that down. So first and foremost, why don't you all just start with, you know, what got you interested in data journalism? So Kimbrielle, you can take it away. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, what got me interested in data journalism? Um, <laughs> That's a great question. I, I guess the simplest answer is, um, you know, when I was really young, you could, I kind of think it's a very PC way of saying it, but you know, you can see things that you have, oh, you could see things happening that you thought were discriminatory. And um, I would want to write about those things, but I knew that um, there would be people who would read your work and just say, oh, well, that's hearsay, or that's just like you're making it up, or you're thinking 
you know, you're just thinking incorrectly. And I remember thinking, um, if I could use data to support ways to show um, discrimination or disenfranchisement or how things aren't systematically fair for a group of people, particularly like minorities or African Americans or, you know, um, disenfranchised populations, that can take some of that argument away from people. And I started doing that. And so I remember before the housing crisis in 2007, um, when I was back in Chicago investigating, I was talking to um, some high income uh, earning African Americans, and they were trying to get these mortgages and they were, er, you know, were earning six figures. And there was this one guy, he couldn't get a home loan for I think it was like $35,000. And I'm like, wait a second, you have, and he had, I think, like $100,000 in the bank, and he had a really good job. And I remember thinking, like, this is what I want to report on. And so I started writing um, stories about that, and that ultimately um, spurred a lawsuit um, against a couple big lenders and ended up being the largest fair housing settlement in the country. And so I feel like data helps support um, some ideas that we have um, about, like, discrimination and things like that. Take it away, you know? Holly. <laughs> okay, so the thing, um, after leaving journalism, I was broadcast specifically, I was really looking to do something that could use those same skills and ended up working opposite uh, Google's diversity uh. and inclusion team. And one of the problems that we were working with alongside with them was this idea of black women not being hired into technology. And the dominant narrative was that it was this pipeline project. They didn't do math. They didn't know, didn't know science. And so we couldn't hire them. But Google as a company is one that is all about the data. You really cannot start to have a conversation unless you have backup evidence. And so I started to construct stories as we would in the newsroom. And one of the things that I was finding were there were other ways that black women were being thought about in that workforce that was creating not only a block to access, but a block to retention. And I had to go through and I had to go through resumes. I had to, I, I had to figure out what the commonalities and then present it out. And as somebody that didn't think about themselves as a technical person or even a data person, realized that I really, really liked this and it increased my marketability in the workplace and I have been working now for almost 10 years doing really really similar work and now in the research field okay so like I said at the start I was a beat reporter I covered Washington Heights in New York City which is a island a, a neighborhood up at the top of Manhattan and I kept hearing a lot of stories from the people that I covered about um, the neighborhood was segregated along Broadway. On one side of, side of the side of the neighborhood, it was really, really white. On the other side, it was really, really, really Dominican. Um, and there were always these conflicts. Um, and and it, it came up time and time again in education, in real estate, in, in, in restaurants, all in everything. Um, and there were all, all these things that I kept hearing that we couldn't prove. So we just started looking for any types of proof, any, any sort, sort of receipts. Um, so we started looking and we found, um, one of the first stories, stories we did was we, when I was at DNA Info, we mapped out um, every single school district, every single school by the largest racial group. So you could just sort of see immediately um, where the clusters of Hispanic schools were and where the clusters of black schools were. Um, and that was, that, that got people talking and from there it just sort of went forward. I've been stumbling through it for years now. Awesome. Well, thank you, you know, for all of you all for sharing just kind of like what got you into the start of um, this venture of data journalism, you know, being your profession. And I hope you guys are listening and taking notes. You know, maybe some of this is speaking to you. Um, and if so, you know, I'm sure you all would be happy to, to share some more insight. But I want to move on to my next question, which is kind of a twofold question. So I'm going to combine it a little bit. So I wanted to know, you know, an example of a time when you used data to tell a story and how it helped you tell that story. Uh, but the other question I had as well was, you know, is there a story that you're most proud of? So that can be the same story or it can be a different one. 
So, Cambrielle, why don't we have you start with that? Wow. Okay. <laughs> I think most proud, and maybe it's one and the same, most proud, the one I was talking about, about subprime lending and African Americans, because like our, like the big get, I remember struggling with the idea of um, how do we make the story like relatable to people who don't typically get it, who may be part of the group that's disempowering people. And, and I remember thinking, I'm going to show what's happening in the most basic form. And um, I remember the nut graph was something like, um, you know, people who were African American were more likely to get subprime loans, you know, those toxic loans. Uh, people who were earning over $100,000 and African American were more likely to get those than somebody who was white earning less than $30,000 a year. And I think when you said that, it didn't matter like what race you were. People were like, wait, how is that fair? How is that happening? And so that was probably one that I was most proud of. Um, in terms of one that, um, that I love to use the data to actually tell the story, because as I'm sure my fellow panelists can agree, um, if you have a lot of data, you can get super wonky and nobody wants to read your story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I love data. I got my t-shirt on probably backwards my data with <laughs> um, so you can really get caught in that world of like being all up in your data and so the thing that you have to constantly remember and I remember this because I used to be an editor also is that you know data only tells you like the trend of the story what's happening but you have to use real voices and people to actually illustrate it and to engage people and so one of the stories I just um, wrote recently um, it was part of the package that uh, we were the finalists for the Pulitzer was about this woman Cynthia Glover and uh, she was this woman in New Orleans, and I should have probably shared the link to the story. And it was an entire narrative piece, but it was built on basically this one sentence, is that essentially she lived in a neighborhood, we were doing a series on homicides where they don't get solved. Like, you know, it's one thing to live in a neighborhood that has a lot of killings. It's another to live in a neighborhood with killings that don't result in an arrest. And so, this one sentence was basically like the gist of the numbers part. Police make an arrest and only one third of the murders in New Orleans, the second lowest rate among 55 cities that responded to a Washington Post survey about homicide rates. Glover's neighborhood, however, has one of the lowest homicide rates in New Orleans with only two of 23 killings in 2010 resulting in charges. Wow. <laughs> right? <laughs> two of 23 killings and so that all those arguments about people like why don't people in those neighborhoods just talk to police why don't but and and then you put yourself in the shoes of this narrative of this woman and you imagine yourself living in a neighborhood where you're thinking hmm there are 23 killings in my three four or five blocks two are only going to result in charges and you start really envisioning what it's like living in that neighborhood and so while we had the data and we could totally like walk out about that in the story we didn't we took a step back and then we use narrative detail to really put people in the shoes of Cynthia Glover and show what it's like living in that neighborhood. So I wanted to I wanted to quickly touch on that. I know you mentioned that you know we don't have that article up for that one, but um, the story that you know you had worked on with the rest of your your colleagues at the Washington Post, I'd be remiss not to mention won a 2016 Pulitzer Prize Award um, for that series and for the data that you all collected. So I do have that. So I'm going to pull that up in a second. And I'm just wondering if maybe you know you can talk a little bit about that um, as far as like characterizing the data. You know, adding that story to the numbers. Sure. And um, I love that series too, because that, while this story series that we did last year was about homicides, uh, that series a few years ago was about officer involved killings. Um, <laughs> the thing that was super interesting about that, I, I remember I was working on that series. Uh, I did the first part with my colleague Kimberly Kendi and Wes Lowry came up with the idea for the series. Um, but we were working on the story for like four or five months. Um, there hadn't been, um, there had been great distance between the Michael Brown um, shooting and killing. And people kept telling us nobody cares that there's all these killings that are happening. And the first series, so that's the database you're showing is how many people were killed each year. Um, we ended up finding out that of about, roughly about, I believe a thousand people each year are shot and killed by police, but only half of those um, I believe my numbers are correct, were actually kept by the FBI. So we found that the FBI was severely undercounting those numbers because they're mostly self-reported. 
But in doing the stories, the first story took a look at what happened um, with the prosecutions. And we found out that in spite of these killings and deaths, it was very rare, like super rare. I want to say like less than 1% or something like that, that these cases actually resulted in a prosecution and ultimately a conviction. And one of the things that I think was really struck me about that series was not only were there twice as many killings as the federal government thought, um, not only was it that few of these cases actually resulted in a prosecution, let alone a conviction, but thirdly, when you look at the aggregate number um, of people who were killed, the largest number of people who killed were white, right? And like people who can look at data will say, oh, look, well, the largest people are not black people, it's white people. But when you correct for the rate of the population in the country, you actually saw exponentially that African Americans were more impacted by this because they had a much greater chance um, of being the subjects of these officer involved shootings. So that's something that you have to not just have the data, but actually put it in context for your readers. And that was something that they had not been known before. And this year as well, thank you. And this year as well, you, uh, you were finalists for the 2019 Pulitzer Prize Award. So just have to mention that as well, shout out. <laughs> It's an amazing accomplishment. You see, guys, you can get major awards in this field. <laughs> Thank you. You can, and writing about in, like issue-oriented stuff that you really care about. I like that part. <laughs> nice. So let's switch it up a little bit, Nigel. Let's have you um, talk about, you know, maybe a favorite story of yours where data was involved. Uh, maybe it was challenging, and that's why you loved it so much. So let's let's have you touch on that. Oh man. Okay. There are there are a ton. It's like choosing your favorite kid. Um, um, but, hey, I sent you the link to the flooding story. Yes, um, I got you. That, this was a story that ran a few months ago, and it started with, um, we, got, we got a report from, uh, from, a, from a researcher that had data that just sort of said that, like, sea levels were rising all across the country, basically. But um, along the East Coast, they're rising most in the mid-Atlantic states. Um, so everywhere from like the Carolinas up to Atlantic City, they, they, were, they were rising the highest. Um, and it was interesting to go from there. But, but afterwards, um, we started talking, I started, I started reaching out to people in those cities to sort of see like, okay, um, this is what the data says. What's your life experience like? And the moment you reach out to people to sort of say like, is this data real? People, people were, were hopped up to talk about it. Some, someone told me that like, um, they, lived in, they lived by the Chesapeake Bay and whenever, whenever they got a strong wind, it would blow wind from the back bay or would blow water from the back bay into, the, into their streets and inundate it. Um, whenever it rained, it would flood. Whenever there was high tide, it, was flood. it would flood. Um, it got to the point where um, there was a quote in there where people said like they made plans around the rain. If it, if it rained, they just, they wouldn't go out. Um, and this is, that's sort of what I love about data. Um, it's one thing to sort of have these interesting numbers that say like, oh, there's this thing happening. It's another thing to sort of take the numbers and apply them to someone's story because um, data can be wonky, data can be spreadsheets, um, but really it's important to like keep in mind that these are all things that either happen to someone or are affecting their lives or is someone. Um, and if you can get beyond the numbers, you can, you can find the actual people. Yeah. So beyond the numbers, I'm going to bring it back to the numbers for one quick second, Nigel. So I'm going to um, pop up that map that was just on the website again for that article and that story you worked on. Mm -hmm. um, why don't you just kind of explain what it is we're looking at and how it relates to your story. So this is the map here. Okay, so this map shows um, sea, like, like weather stations all along the East Coast, um, and basically they are colored by the amount um, that, that the waters have risen, that sea levels have risen since, 19, since 1900. Um, and so you can see down in Miami, they're, like, they got 5 to 10 inches, uh, but up in the Chesapeake Bay area, that's where you start, start seeing 15 plus inches. And that's really where you saw the most problems. That's where people um, got to just sort of, they, they lived with boots, you know? Like if, if they would try not to park their cars anywhere near water because it, it wouldn't even matter. You're just, you're, you're living in a flood zone. So I was, you know, obviously I was reading through this story and there was just so much that I could tell 
went into it, right? I mean, you had interviews with, you know, scientists from a variety of different, you know, institutions. You spoke with people all up and down, you know, the East Coast. So, you know, I don't know if you can share a little bit about, you know, the, the kind of work that goes into finding this data, right? Um, and then the, the amount of time spent and how you just kind of make sense of it all. <laughs> okay, so um, this one, the data came to us first. Um, there was actually a researcher that had done a study um, on something completely and totally different. They were looking at like why sea levels had, ri had risen in the East Coast, um, in the Middle Atlantic States the most. Um, and a lot of times that's where stories can start. Um, someone will say, hey, I got some numbers. Um, we got some brand new numbers. Um, I try not to get focused on the brand new. Um, I try to get focused, I try to focus on what's behind the numbers. So the angle of why is this happening wasn't quite there. I mean, and there are some interesting reasons for why it's happening. Some people say that it's the way that the earth has reformed itself since the last ice age. Um, some people say that it's global warming and um, some people just sort of say, hey man, sea levels rise, you know, what, what, what are you going to do about it? Um, but from there, it was just a matter of um, looking to see which areas were, were the most affected and then, then just like reaching out to everybody up and down and any sort of research group, any sort of community group, any sort of politician. Um, I came across a Facebook group called Stop the Flooding in Virginia Beach. Um, I, I reached out to that Facebook group and everyone wanted to talk. They were, everyone was like, oh my God, we thought that this was an, this was an isolated problem for us that our city government wasn't dealing with it. Um, so it was great to sort of be able to sort of connect the dots and show everybody like this is a significantly bigger issue. So you bring me to a really good point. Um, actually, Mitali, you know, I know that kind of goes hand in hand with the work that you do, right? Is yeah. with journalists to try and like tell them, hey, this is a big issue. Um, and, you know, I know you, you work a little bit on the diversity side of, you know, AI and, and data. So why don't you speak to, you know, some of the challenges that you face on your end? Um, of trying so to get the word I out. have just, I'm really busy at the moment, so I, I have just sent you a report that I worked on on YouTube and spreading white supremacy here at Data and Society. And so one of the things that we'll do is we will look at what is currently going on in terms of trends um, in the world and then try and figure out how to commission reports that will speak to the zeitgeist. So at the time the YouTube report was coming about, I was in, um, in the, it was primarily authored by my colleague, Rebecca Williams, but I was um, in the editorial meeting because we have editorial meetings like you would do in any news organization. And one of the things that was really interesting to me was this idea that white supremacy was spreading and we needed to find out where it came from. And at the time, the dominant um, ideas in the press were it's these weird white kids that have no friends that are sitting uh, in a room somewhere. So we, I actually work directly with computer scientists and we will go into the back end of these programs and start to chart and document how stories are moving. So every time somebody clicks them, where do they click them? Where is that click reposted? And then what happens afterwards? And this report came out 2018. And of course, when Christchurch happened in February, we would then, and we sent it out then, we got great press. So we would, set, we would send all this stuff out to people like Nigel. And usually, and it's so helpful, Nigel, that you were like, we don't, I don't go for, hey, here are the new numbers, because that's the way that we pitch every report pretty much. <laughs> um, but we can then go out to, Nigel might not be the beat reporter for online platforms, right? It might be a colleague of his, somebody else might be uh, covering the internet. So we will go in and we will let them know the trend. But on the research side, we don't then try to construct the story. But what we do do is that we are then a resource if the journalist is coming back to me and saying, where did you get this information? Who did you speak to? We can then share that information with the journalist, but it's really up to them to construct the story. And certainly, um, 
I don't do so much of diversity work just because that's not really my area of interest. I'm interested more in how power is moving and how the internet is becoming a conduit to that movement of power. And uh, we will, we then kind of back out. So I would say that Nigel in speaking about his, the last story is absolutely completely correct. But I know that I've done a good job if that journalist will come back to me or people from that network will come back to me and say either we've got this report, what does it mean? Or what are you thinking about? And um, that's why I, ha I try to have closed door meetings with journalists where um, I can speak about the kinds of things that the research world are thinking about. And, and then if, if they want me to, I can help craft the story, but it's really more about letting them know they do not need to be computer scientists. They do not need to go and break into systems to get this work. There is another layer of people who are working on the actual code and then putting it into report form. So we put it into the narrative form that we can, but our hope is there's going to be another person that we can hand off to who can get that really good human story. And in the case of the YouTube report, once Christchurch came along, we have provided a theoretical framework to think about. This isn't just one isolated person. This is a worldwide networked community and what they're really scared about across the world is the fact that the world is getting browner and they are going to lose dominance and that's the that's the yep the report's up now that's a that's the um that's the underlying story and then each each outlet will look at that particular message um, in you know whichever way they want to but that the particular one that's up now was really, really popular because people think about YouTube and they think about makeup and they think about, you know, beauty, beauty tutorials. They don't necessarily think about this networked power. Nice, nice. So yeah, so I wanted to put this report back up. Um, and, you know, I get from a lot of what you're talking about, Mitali, is this idea of collaboration and, you know, how helpful that is, especially, you know, for someone who is looking for, for these numbers and how they can get their stories out or maybe even just get sources, um, which leads me to my next um, and really last question before we get to some Q&A. So let me use this time, y'all, I'm buying y'all some time because I see there's so many of you guys who are tuned in right now. But if you missed this, um, I just wanted to note again that before we get to the Q&A, you're going to notice a very helpful um, tab right at the bottom of the Zoom. It's for Q&A, so just drop your questions in there. Um, for our lovely speakers, literally anything um, as far as, you know, the subject goes of, of data, um, you guys are just going to want to drop that in there. And I for you guys or you all will answer them <laughs> but um but yeah so this Kimbrielle I feel like you know you could definitely speak to this um I know you mentioned Mitali that diversity isn't necessarily um, your your bread and butter or what you're mm -hmm. focused on right but maybe Kimbrielle you can speak to you know the importance of diversity as far as data goes and data journalism and you know why diverse voices in this field specifically are so important yeah, diversity is it's hugely important. And, um, you know, it, when you go to, or, sorry, I, <laughs> I was trying to be on mute. <laughs> I love it. I've got mine too. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So you're making all this noise and then you're not even in the screen. Okay. <laughs> I have a new puppy. Um, so basically with diversity, it's, it's important because when you write about issues like Prince now it's just all this weird. Okay, sorry. Um, when you write about issues of diversity, um, I think about when I was writing um, about Prince George's County, um, and you know, as this, you know, when I grew up in the Midwest, thinking about Prince George's County as like this mecca for like black people and black wealth, you know, on, on the East Coast. And when I came, you know, years after the housing crisis had ended, and I saw that the foreclosure numbers were still going up. I mean, like. I'm like black and I, you know, and I'm like, wow, somebody should really take a look at this. And I remember asking around for data and people saying like, oh, well, this is aggregated data. But I was like, no, I wanna see like how big of a problem this was because this was like in, I think 2012, 2013, the housing crisis happened in what, like 07, 08. 
And, and nobody, be, when I heard rumors that like the foreclosure numbers were going up, people were like, no, that's impossible. People have already recovered. They, they made their money back, but I kept pushing for it and pushing for that story to be told. And we ended up finding out that it was true that foreclosures were increasing and we, and we were trying to answer the question for why. And so I think, you know, if that was a reporter who, um, you know, was not a person of color, would they have still done the story? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but I think that when you have more people in the field, and I don't think there's, like, there are people who are of color who, who obviously look at this panel who are interested in data, but I think when you go to a lot of these conferences, there's not a ton of representation. I see my panel is nodding. <laughs> um, I mean, sometimes you can be in a room full of, of folks and be like, hey, there's the other, you know, person of color. Um, and, and so I think we need more people like that. And I think that there are organizations like the IDB Well Society that is trying, and NABJ, who are like trying to encourage like more training because I think um, there definitely need to be more people in the room. But then I think there's a second thing that happens is, you know, some people make assumptions about like, you know, people of color. And when you have that extra voice in the room, I remember writing the Prince George's story and um, I went to this town I don't know if you guys know, uh, it was the town of Bowie. And so everybody calls, oh, Bowie, Bowie. It's like a name. Like you say it so often that it, it loses its meaning, right? And so I remember thinking, well, I'm not from here. Like, who is this Bowie? And um, I ended up going to like the National Archives and, and finding out the history that this was actually an individual, a person, and in fact was one of the largest landowners um, during that day and had a lot of crops. And, you know, we know the history in Maryland. And so I ended up finding, going to the slave archives and actually quantifying how many people were living in this area. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is like this family. And then I said, oh, wait, but Bowie State is an HBCU and is nearby. Wait, what does this mean? And so I think when you have that context of being a person of color, it adds uh, more texture to the story. You're not just reporting the numbers and what you're observing as a person viewing people of color. You're actually seeing the nuances and you're able to explain that better to your audience. Mm -hmm. That's really good. That's really good. Thank you, Kimbriel. So as I mentioned, we're gonna get to Q&A now because I wanna make sure we have time for all of y'all's questions. Thank you so much for um, typing them in. I've been looking um, over them and you guys have some really good ones. So let's just get straight into it. So Chanel Stitt, asks and you know Nigel can real um, maybe you can answer this what advice or tips would you give to students at a college newspaper when it comes to data journalism and what are types of data that could be used on campus and Nigel I know you uh, were so kind to provide some slides that you did not create but you did <laughs> <laughs> he made sure I got that right that you didn't create but you were so awesome to share with us so I'm gonna pull that up as well but if either of you have some advice for Chanel let's do it Okay, so college is hard because um, it's not a government, unless you're in a public college. If you're in a public college, you, um, everything is, is foyable. Um, get familiar with your freedom of information laws in your, in your particular state, um, because if you are at a public institution and they have information, you are, um, you're, you're, you're entitled to that information. You can file a request saying, hey, Give me that information. Um, other, other than that, I say, take a look at the subjects that you're interested in, and then think about who would logically have that information. And even if no one, say, even if there are no spreadsheets publicly available, or if, any, if nothing's quite out there, you can still reach out to the people that care about that sort of subject and see if they have anything. Can I just add on to that? Um, there's a couple things that I think would be great for students. I also teach um, uh, in college a uh, quantitative methods class. And so um, if you go to IRE.org and maybe we can post the link to this, it's investigative reporters and editors. And um, basically it's, uh, if you want to win an IRE award, which a lot of investigative reporters do, um, they, they apply for this award and they have a bunch of meticulous questions, like 18 questions. And, but the great thing about it is basically they've told you how they do, yeah. So when you look under, I think it's like the, uh, 
Resource Center. You click under Resource Center. And you scroll down. You can get tip sheets from all the investigative stories, but I always click on stories. And when you click on stories, you can type in something like um, race. We'll just say race. Any story that's, and so they have 27,000 investigative stories, and I think it's over a 40 year period of everything involving that search. And so when you are a member, you can click into a story and it pulls up not only the entire series of stories, but what's most critical is the questionnaire that they filled out to apply for the award. So if you scroll down and if you remember, the PDF would show up and you click on that and it literally lists bullet by bullet. I call them my recipes for an investigation. And so students, I make my students read this instead of a textbook and I'll take the best stories and I'll say, okay, read how they did that. And then we critique it. What was good? What was bad? What can you use going forward? And so I think that that's a really good resource center. Also, um, government data and data that's already available through FOIA and public, state public records laws are available online too. Like people don't necessarily have to send in a public records request to get information. They could go to FOIA.gov or a variety of federal agencies and get that information readily available today. And can I just add on to that? For students at student newspapers, you should also figure out if your school has any type of science and technology courses. Um, I'm going to be at Harvard um, doing uh, some research next year, for example, and I'm reaching out to people at the Divinity School because they're doing some really, really interesting work around AI and ethics, which is like a big deal right now. But you are going to be able to get the original research and you're probably going to be able to have access to the computer scientists that are pulling up those numbers. And then your job as the journalist is to then put the meat on the bones of that. But you could, you could potentially win some awards by breaking some of those stories at, ex at the play place that they're originating. Nice, awesome. And again, you guys are keeping these questions going. Thank you so much. Um, and Kimbrielle, I'm glad you talked about FOIA, right? We had a question from an anonymous attendee who had some questions about that. And um, this question actually came um, from Twitter. So I got this earlier before the webinar started, but it's kind of twofold because someone else asked something similar. So I'm gonna combine the two. So Jay Jackson in Mishawaka, Indiana, she wanted to know if the source of your story doesn't know the data. As a journalist, do you tell them as a heads up you know, could this interfere with the story? And then the other side, uh, maybe Taryn Marie Jenkins asked, what happens when someone challenges your numbers um, and your data? So what happens if, you know, you want to interview someone and they don't know the data? Do you tell them beforehand? Maybe, maybe Nigel, you can speak to this. Um, or, you know, in a, another situation, what happens if someone challenges those numbers? Okay. Um, if I'm interviewing someone and they don't know anything about the data, they've never seen it before, I will generally give them the contours of it. Um, I'll say something along the lines of, we've, we've, we've gotten some information, we've looked at some patterns, and we see that in, among states in this area, we're noticing that a lot of states um, are showing this trend. Does that match up? Um, I try to give them just a general idea without getting, diving into specifics. I wouldn't give someone the straight spreadsheet. Um, and then when it comes to what I would do if someone were to challenge the, the data, um, I, I take steps to make sure that everything I do is reproducible. Um, and my team and my editors, we try to go through everything before we publish. And if someone were to have um, a challenge, it's just a matter of saying, here are the original sources, here's exactly what we did, go and do it, see it for yourself. And, if we're wrong, we will make a correction. Um, I'm never too old to learn. Awesome, awesome. And you know, if anyone else wants to add on to that quickly, what I'm gonna do is, cause again, this ends at 7.15 and we have to make sure we're on time for the next webinar that's starting. But real quick. Hey, can, uh, very quickly in the Please, report. As you do that, I'm bringing up some slides. Okay, perfect. <laughs> in the report world, we have to publish our methodology how we came to our determinations, because just so our work can stand up for itself, always. I was, the only thing I was gonna add is, we have a, a no surprises rule with the Washington Post. And so one, you should always tell your sources what you're talking about and take the time to give them a primer. Because of course, nobody wants to 
to a billionaire owned newspaper. Um, and so you want to make that very clear. But secondly, um, you want to keep a data diary, um, yeah. like Nigel had mentioned, where you actually show exactly everything that you did from acquiring the data um, to the steps to cleaning it to analyzing it. And then you want to vet that without sometimes with outside sources. I believe the series last year, um, the source was in the field of cartography um, that we took a lot. Nigel's laughing. Is that the right the cartographer? Yes. Um, but it was like an, these academic experts that you want who, who study this stuff um, mm -hmm. all the time. And so you want to kind of uh, take that information data and say like, hey, this is how I'm taking want to take a look at that and, and getting their their opinions ahead of time before you actually have to publish. And we love that. Us geeks love that. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. So guys, again, um, I'm going to try and get through some of these questions before we have to end. This will probably be the last one, but I do just want to shout out Chris Grisby. You know, he asked, how do you all keep the audience engaged, keep following the story about being so number driven? Um, he mentions as a visual storyteller, you know, having to add statistics can be hard without the proper, proper graphics. So, you know, I don't know if you want to touch on that. Um, another question from Joyce Phillip. How do you feel about data often being used in news from websites like NerdWallet and sources like those? I guess kind of like generic, hey, we did this study, we just want to push it out. How do you feel about sources like those as opposed to news outlets? And I think I think I I think I hit them all. Let me see. Do you yeah, do you make your own graphics? That's another one. So big question about graphics. That seems to be kind of a theme. So maybe if real quick someone can talk about graphics. Um, and then, you know, being a visual storyteller, how do you, how do you balance the two? So, so we'll, go ahead. we'll sometimes send out, so we'll sometimes send out a report and we will send out suggested slides for style guides um, a, a, against that. And the number story, how do we stop things being so numbers driven? We're always trying to figure out the story behind the numbers and both my key, my panelists, my co-panelists have touched on that. Um, that's all I got. Awesome. I, I was just going to say for us, you know, obviously we have a lot of data visualists. Um, and so there's a lot of things to look at. One, when we created the database of killings, we thought, okay, this would be a great map, but we didn't want a static map. We wanted something that was interactive. So that addresses the issue of engaging an audience. So you can go to your city and find where each of the killings are, and you can click on it and find out the circumstances. And you can move it around and do your own analysis. And so we had that one thing that we combined, I believe, with Mapbox. But then secondly, we needed um, the presentation when you actually launch into the story too. And it's something that was different, not just like a bar chart. And so this, oh, our designer actually decided to take the list of every single person that had been killed and put in a different color the ones that led to an arrest. So all you saw were like the thousands and thousands upon names. And that was like very stunning. It was like art, but you immediately got this very, you know, non-typical way of displaying the data, but you got the point quickly. Amazing. Do you have any two quick words, Nigel? <laughs> We're reaching yeah. our end time. So for people that want to like make charts and graphics, there's a, there's a website called datawrapper.de um, that can help you build charts and maps and all sorts of stuff very, very quickly. You don't need to know how to do any sort of coding whatsoever. Um, back when I was at DNA Info and we had no tools, that's what I used all the time. Um, in terms of how to make data fun, interactivity, let people like explore it and see themselves in it. Perfect. All right, guys, thank you so much, so much to our lovely speakers. You guys have been amazing and answering all of these amazing questions that you all have um, contributed. And Sharday White with the last one, will this webinar be available later on? Yes, it will. So you guys be sure to check on NABJ's website. Um, this webinar should be up uh, probably by tomorrow. <laughs> next couple of days. So yeah, stay tuned for the next webinar coming up with the Black News Channel. But we appreciate you guys watching and until next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs> oh, I love it. Bye. <laughs> so awesome. Thanks everyone. <laughs> Thanks guys. That was so fun.